Explicit content is found in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. It isn't very often that I stumble upon a case where a family is riddled with criminals. I often focus on the individual. In this episode, you'll hear about the Weaver family and their tangled web of crimes. Okay, on to the show. Ward Francis Weaver III was born on April 6, 1963, to Trish and Ward Weaver Jr. His mother Trish would recount that her son was a happy child. He watched Western movies and was enamored with John Wayne. He would play the cowboy hero and run around the house yelling, Charge! However, his early years weren't always looked upon fondly by his family members. Trish met Robert Boudreaux at a hotel bar in 1967 after divorcing Ward Weaver Jr. If Trish was expecting to be happier with Robert, she was in for a rude awakening. Robert was an alcoholic who often spent his time in local bars running up tabs. When one was calling for payment, he'd switch to a new bar and start there. Trish tried to shelter her children from Robert's violent outbursts, but it wasn't always effective. There were nights when Trish would load the kids into the car late at night, going from bar to bar searching for her husband. When he did make it home, he often beat the children. They were relieved on the nights their mother couldn't find him. That meant one less beating. When Ward was four years old, he fell out of a second-story window. His mother and stepfather ran out to check on the crying and frightened child. In order to calm him down, Robert offered Ward a dollar. He calmed and focused on his new prize. His mother then saw him circle back to the window, looking out over the ledge to the ground below. She said it looked as if he was contemplating, jumping, just to get another dollar. In 1970, the family moves to North Bend, Oregon, following Robert's work as a longshoreman. He continued his excessive drinking, and Trish was forced to waitress part-time, just to help pay the tabs he accrued. They were living in subsidized housing and were barely able to make ends meet. All of the children recall that their home was simply a place to eat and sleep. It was not a family environment, despite the efforts that Trish made. In 1975, a summer job in Sacramento, California beckoned Robert. He suggested to Trish that 12-year-old Ward accompany him on the trip. Trish agreed to let Ward join his stepfather. She hoped that Ward would be inspired to work hard after watching his stepfather at work. But instead, Robert brought Ward and left him in the motel room all day. He went to work, then to the bar, and sometimes returned to the room. It isn't clear what happened between the two, but a co-worker called Trish and informed him that for the past few weeks, Ward had been left alone. Trish was enraged and demanded that they return home. Robert complied, and when the truck pulled into the driveway, Ward exited the vehicle abruptly with an angry sneer on his face as he rushed past his mother. Trish recalls thinking that that was the day she lost her son. After that, his behavior changed and he became violent towards his siblings. He focused his anger on his half-brother, Robert Jr. He would tie his brother to a tree with a dog chain and leave him there for hours on end. The children were largely unsupervised throughout their childhood, so Ward had free reign to terrorize his siblings. One particularly chilling incident happened when Ward forced his brother's face close to the neighbor's fence. On the other side of that fence was a dog that liked to jump up, bark, and snap at people as they walked by. Ward forced his brother to come face to face with the dog. Robert cried out for Ward to let him go, but Ward kept forcing his face closer and closer while laughing at his brother's fear. The dog came close to biting Robert's face, but before he did, Ward released his grip and Robert ran away. Ward would often shoot his siblings in the back with a BB gun. His violence continued to escalate as he aged into high school. By then, he had sprouted quickly but was still overweight. He was into ACDC and smoking marijuana. He was bold enough to wear a roach clip in his hat when he walked the halls of his high school. 
He was unremarkable as a peer, but managed to graduate high school six months early. He got a job at a local burger joint and was trying to figure out his next step in life. In 1981, Ward was accused by a teenage relative of rape and abuse. His sister Tammy recalls that this was not the first accusation against Ward. When he was 12, he was accused of a similar crime. The police investigated the latest accusation, but they opted not to pursue it any further. Ward had enlisted in the Navy Reserve and would be leaving Portland in a few months. They figured it would be useless to pursue the charge with him away. His relative never got the justice she deserved. In the Navy Reserve, he was stationed in the Philippines. He fell into the same habits of his stepfather and father. He stayed out late partying and drinking, then recovering the rest of the day by sleeping off his drunkenness. In one of the bars, he met a native Filipina woman, Maria Stout. He partied with the young woman almost weekly. Streaks of his possessiveness and jealousy were not entirely off-putting to the young woman. He was reported to his superiors for missing five days of work. The Navy opted to give him an other-than-dishonorable discharge. On May 17, 1982, he took Maria with him back to the United States, where the young couple resided in the unfinished basement of his mother's home. The passion Maria thought she had in her relationship quickly soured. The young couple bickered and argued almost on a daily basis. Ward established rules on how he expected his new fiancé to behave and forbade her to leave the house without an escort. Maria became pregnant in February of 1982. By July, she was in the hospital after suffering through a beating doled out by Ward. Trish was by her side, urging her to file charges, but she refused. Ward was arrested that evening, but no charges were filed. Ward, wanting to put distance between his mother and his new wife, decided to move to Southern California. He moved to Bakersfield in 1984 to be closer to his father, who by this time was in prison and tried to reconnect with him. The pair caught up on lost time, but nothing changed Ward's behavior towards Maria or their children. Maria and Ward would end up having three children together, Francis, Alex, and Mallory. And like Trish did before her, Maria tried her best to give her kids a normal childhood. But her own drug addiction, coupled with a father like Ward, meant the kid's childhood would not look that much different from Ward's. Ward may have been doomed from the start. By the time Ward was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes, his father, Ward Pete Weaver Jr., had already been on death row for 18 years. Pete's childhood was rough. His mother, Dorothy Weaver, absolutely hated men. A witness claimed to have seen Dorothy chasing her sons with a butcher knife, screaming that she was going to cut off their penis. Despite her clear hatred for him, Pete loved his mother deeply and would do anything for her. Trish left her husband as their tumultuous relationship was becoming more and more violent. Ward would not see his father again until Pete was on trial for murder. In 1978, Pete spent a year and a half in prison for rape. His absence was explained to his son Rodney, about eight years old at the time, as a business trip. In 1984, Pete Weaver was found guilty of murdering 18-year-old Air Force recruit Robert Radford. Pete beat Robert to death with a piece of pipe. After killing Robert, Pete then kidnapped Robert's 23-year-old girlfriend, Barbara Lavoie. He raped her repeatedly, and at one point, while she was struggling, Barbara bit Pete's thumb hard enough to draw blood. Pete's timber exploded, and he strangled Barbara to death with a diaper. After killing her, Pete buried her body in his backyard and then poured concrete over her grave. He enlisted 10-year-old Rodney to help him dig the hole. While his son was at school, Pete dumped Barbara's body in the hole, filled it, covered it with concrete, then built a deck on top. Rodney recalled watching police dig up the grave after his father confessed to Barbara's murder. He watched as police broke up the concrete slab and removed it, piece by piece. 
as they removed the last pieces of concrete, Barbara's body was revealed. The sight would stay with Rodney for his entire life. Pete's crime may have never been discovered had he never talked about it. While serving a 42-year sentence for raping a 15-year-old girl and setting up her 18-year-old boyfriend's murder in 1981, Pete bragged about the murder to a fellow inmate. The inmate went to the authorities with the information in hopes of receiving time off of his sentence. When confronted by authorities about the murder, Pete asked to talk to his mother. After talking to her on the phone, she told Pete to unburden himself. Pete hung up with her and then confessed to the crimes. At a sanity hearing for Pete, Trish testified to Pete's violent temper and cruelty. She spoke of a time when she playfully bit Pete while they were wrestling. Pete immediately began to strangle her. That was when she learned that Pete's mother used to bite Pete until he bled as punishment. It was also during this hearing that Pete's younger sister testified that Pete raped her when she was 12 and then told her she was pregnant. It only took 42 minutes for the jury to find Pete sane. The day after that, he was sentenced to death for the murder of Robert Radford and Barbara Lavoie. An Oregon Live article that looks closely at the lives of Pete and Ward found many similarities between the two. Both grew up in violent families and were known to be cruel to animals and their siblings. Both had been accused of beating and raping a family member. Both were obsessive about the women in their lives and forced strict rules that warranted vicious beatings when broken. And both had violent tempers, but claimed to experience dissociation during their violent crimes. By 1984, the children had been removed from the home on several occasions and returned when Maria was able to provide a safer home for them. This, of course, would be short-lived as soon as Ward returned home. He had trouble holding down a job, so he would live with friends or in his car. He and Maria couldn't stand to be together for more than weeks at a time, so he was often away from home. The family moved again to Fairfield, California where they resided with the Ordonia family. They were a Filipino family that sold Filipino products out of their home. The family often witnessed a tumultuous life led by the weavers, but did nothing to intervene. They witnessed Maria beating Francis, Ward leaving to get drunk and coming back in a stupor. The dysfunctional cycle seemed to continue every week. Maria was pregnant with her third child, when Ward would be accused of another heinous attack. It was Father's Day in 1986, when Ward decided that his day had been ruined. Maria made no effort to give Ward gifts from the children, likely out of spite. Ward took this to heart and went to the bowling alley. He smoked some marijuana, took a speedball, and drank several beers and vodka screwdrivers. He called the Ordonia house and asked for a ride back home. The parents sent their daughters, 16-year-old Jennifer and 13-year-old Jocelyn, to retrieve Ward from the bowling alley. When Ward got into the van, the three headed back to the house. Ward asked Jennifer to pull over so he could relieve himself. He got out, picked up a concrete chunk, opened the passenger side door, and struck 13-year-old Jocelyn in the head. She screamed out and tried to shield her head from further blows. She fell to the floor of the van trying to scoot away from Ward's grip. Jennifer unbuckled herself and pushed Ward away from her sister. He put her in a headlock and pulled her down to the ground with him. She gasped for air as he tightened the hold on her. She yelped, Ward, it's me. Jennifer, what are you doing? She recalled seeing Ward's eyes look blank like he wasn't even there. She ended up freeing herself from his strong hold and kicked him out of the van and sped away. When she arrived to her home, she immediately informed her mom of what happened. 23-year-old Ward was arrested for the attack on Jennifer and Jocelyn. He was sentenced to three years in prison for his crime. He was released in 1988 and moved with Maria and their three children to Canby, Oregon. They purchased a small gift shop that Maria operated while Ward went out and drank the day away. 
They lost the store within two years, which put Maria on the verge of ending their relationship once and for all. Ward was amping up his drug use and even began dabbling in selling drugs. In 1993, after one vicious fight, she requested and was granted a restraining order against her husband. Ward and Maria formally divorced later that year, and he began dating 18-year-old Christy Sloan. He continued his possessive, manipulative, and abusive behavior with her, and she confused Ward's overbearing behavior for love. He again laid out rules for her on what she was permitted to do. Christy was still finding herself and often rebelled against Ward. One particular night, he beat her with an iron skillet. Ward was arrested for the attack, but she told prosecutors that she was terrified of testifying against him since there was nothing protecting her after the ordeal was over. In Linda O'Neill's controversial book, Missing, The Oregon City Girls, she remembers talking to Christy and asking her why she would stay with Ward after he had beat her so viciously. Christy told Linda a bone-chilling tale. When Ward got out of jail, he found out that I was in California and somehow got my sister's phone number. Then he called me up, told me to drop the assault charges, come back to Portland, and become his wife. I told him he must be on drugs or something to think that I would even consider getting back with him after what he had done. Then he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He said that I had exactly one week to come back, drop the charges, and marry him. He told me, you know that I know where she lives. In 1996, the couple got married, but it didn't last very long. They divorced after four years when Ward's abuse, drinking, and infidelity became intolerable. He moved out to a rental home with his girlfriend off Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City, Oregon, along with his children, Francis and Mallory. Mallory Weaver was a typical middle schooler who invited her friends over to hang out. They did homework, listened to music, and talked about boys. One of her friends, Ashley Pond, visited regularly and eventually moved in for a few months to escape her troubled home. Ward noticed the young girl and found her attractive. He learned that Ashley was a neglected girl whose mother was a depressed alcoholic. This is what allowed him to warm his way into Ashley's life. He took his time to groom Ashley, to make her feel like she had a father figure in Ward. Their relationship became more and more inappropriate. They were spotted by Ashley's teacher, sharing a passionate kiss in the parking lot. Her teacher reported what she saw to children's services, but nothing ever came of it. They were also rumored to have shared the same bed once Ward's girlfriend left, after confronting Ward about his relationship with Ashley. It was when Ward took Ashley on vacation with him and his family that he tried to take their relationship to the next level. I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsor. Ward attempted to have his way with her, luring her into his bedroom where he tried to rape her. She managed to get away and returned to her home. Ashley was very familiar with sexual assault because of her biological father, Wesley Rotger. Ashley attempted to form a relationship with Wesley after learning that the man that had raised her was not her real father. It was then that she was attacked by Wesley. Wesley began sexually assaulting Ashley, and her behavior quickly changed. She was becoming more withdrawn and sullen. When her mother asked her what was going on, Ashley confessed that Wesley raped her each time she visited his home. Her mother, Lori, was shaken by the news and immediately reported the abuse to authorities. Eventually, he was charged with 40 counts of rape and abuse on Ashley. He pled no contest to just one count of attempted unlawful penetration and was eventually sentenced to 120 months of probation. 
The reason why Wesley was able to plead down to just one charge was because of a phone call from a man who claimed that Ashley was prone to making up rape allegations. That man was Ward Weaver. It was early August when Ashley and Lori go to the authorities about Ward's attempted rape. However, nothing happens. Her paperwork was poorly handled by the authorities, which meant that Ward was never formally charged or held accountable for the attempted rape. She stopped speaking to Mallory and felt shunned by mutual friends who thought that she made up the allegation for attention. She struggled over the course of the next year to regain her confidence. She began to make great strides in her education, and her grades began to improve. By December of 2001, she began speaking to Mallory again. On January 9th, 2002, Ashley said goodbye to her mother, who has passed out on the couch, and ran off to catch her school bus. She never made it to school. At some point, she was lured by Ward Weaver to his home, where she took five shots of whiskey, either voluntarily or involuntarily. He viciously attacked her and eventually buried her in a barrel in his backyard. When she was reported missing, she was initially thought to be a runaway. After all, the girl had a tumultuous home life, and her mother's new boyfriend was not her cup of tea. Had Ashley finally had enough of this life and ran off to live somewhere else? After a week of Ashley making no contact, Authorities now believe she had been abducted. They zeroed in on her biological father, but his alibi checked out. They discovered that over 90 registered sex offenders lived in Ashley's apartment complex. Linda O'Neill, a private investigator whose husband had been married to Ashley's grandmother, watched the local news to keep abreast of any updates. She recalled seeing Ashley's friend and classmate, 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis gave an interview to a reporter, saying it was really hard to know that this happened to a friend. But what happened to Ashley? Authorities were still tailing likely suspects, but they were getting nowhere. It seemed as if Ashley had disappeared into thin air. No one had a clue where she was. Each lead was a dead end. Then, in March of 2002, the unthinkable happened. Miranda Gaddis disappeared. The girls lived in the same complex, and the police and FBI realized that this was not a coincidence. The community was in a panic and concerned that their young daughters were no longer safe. Miranda was born on November 18, 1988, and attended the same middle school as her friend, Ashley Pond. She aspired to become a model and wanted to continue her career in dance. She and Ashley were on the same dance team, but that wasn't the only experience they had in common. Miranda had been systematically abused the majority of her life by her father and then her mother's boyfriend. She knew that Ward Weaver had tried to rape Ashley once before in California and did her best to look out for her friend. She never stayed longer than a night at her friend Mallory's house because of what she knew about her father. She had even warned her sister about spending time with Mallory, telling her to watch out, otherwise Ward Weaver would molest her. Linda O'Neill had already been investigating Ashley's disappearance on behalf of Ashley's family when she learned that Miranda went missing. She contacted Ashley's family and requested all of Ashley's contacts. Linda, Ashley's mother, told her of Ward Weaver, a family friend whom Ashley had accused earlier in 2001 of attempting to assault her. When Linda investigated Ward, she discovered his colored past of assaulting young women. Linda set her sights on Ward and investigated a little deeper. When trying to look into her arrest records, she was shocked to see his name associated with death row. She realized that his father was on death row for the murder of two hitchhikers. When she realized this, she was sure that Ward Weaver had something to do with the girl's disappearance. Another P.I. named Harry Oakes, who was working independently, brought his scent dogs to investigate. The dog picked up Ashley's scent from her apartment, and it led to Ward Weaver's home. He knocked on Ward's door and asked if he could search his home. It was a brave move, but Ward welcomed it. Harry's dog gave him two death alerts 
one in the hallway, and one over a freshly poured concrete slab in Ward's backyard. After leaving Ward's home, Harry filed a report with the Oregon City Police Department. The report was ignored by police and the FBI. The report was also given to Lori Pond, who passed it along to Linda. Linda noticed immediately that there was a similarity between father and son. They both had freshly poured concrete slabs in their backyards. She wondered if Ashley's body was being concealed underneath. She upped her investigation and interviewed those who knew the girls and Ward. The stories she got were terrifying. She learned that Ward had expressed to friends that he was growing increasingly angry with Miranda Gaddis because she warned other teenage girls about Ward. Ward had also gotten word that Linda O'Neill was speaking with his ex-wives and other people who had negative experiences with him. She arrived home one day to find her teenage son speaking to Ward Weaver about his car. She told him that her family was off limits to him, and Ward replied, I was here to tell you the same thing. Kids are so naive, aren't they? He then left in his vehicle, and Linda began carrying a loaded gun in her purse. She was prepared to deal with Ward if he threatened her again. After being dismissed again by the FBI, Linda opted to contact the news media to bring Ward to the forefront as a suspect. She contacted Jim Redden, a Portland Tribute reporter, and asked if he would accompany her to Ward's house for an interview. Ward welcomed them into his home and was very candid. He came off as just a regular guy. When the article was published, the community began to question why Ward wasn't a suspect in the girl's disappearance. He went on a media tour of sorts and granted all kinds of interviews. In one particularly innocuous interview, he says of Ashley's disappearance, she's better off hiding out wherever she's found a place to live. A few days after the interview, a raid was executed on a home and vehicles were seized. Sadly. Ward was not the target of that raid. It was a neighbor man who had taken a camping trip the same day that Miranda Gaddis disappeared. He also failed a polygraph test and had been interviewed six times by the Oregon City Police and the FBI. He was eventually ruled out as a suspect. The authorities were back at square one, with no more leads or suspect. Ward was still in the mind of the media, but he had enough of their questions. He was no longer interested in the attention and scrutiny that was being placed on him or his past. He began telling friends that he was moving away to Mexico or Idaho and started selling off his personal items. He wouldn't get far because he couldn't control his impulses. On August 13, 2002, Ward picked up Randy Oneida, the 19-year-old girlfriend of his son, Francis, and mother of his grandchild. She thought nothing was odd about Ward's behavior that day, but she quickly realized that he had changed when they walked inside the home. He threw her to the ground, ripped off her clothing, and viciously raped her. She pushed him off with her feet and ran out of the house naked. She grabbed the tarp that was covering the concrete slab and ran towards the street. She flagged down a passing motorist and the police quickly responded. Ward was arrested and charged with rape. Francis Weaver was the one who would be his father's undoing. After learning about the rape of his girlfriend, Francis was the one to call 911. During that call, he would reveal that his father admitted to killing Ashley and Miranda. This would lead to Ward's arrest and ultimately the search warrant that would lead to the recovery of Ashley and Miranda's bodies. Miranda's remains were found in a box in a shed, and Ashley's body was found in a barrel that had been buried under a concrete slab. During his father's trial, when asked by ABC's Good Morning America if he thought his father was guilty, Francis would reply, I'm certain, yes, the whole thing just disgusts me. I hate to even think that I was brought into this world from a man like that. It would ultimately be revealed through DNA testing that Ward was not Francis's biological father but that didn't stop Francis from following in his father's and grandfather's footsteps. There were signs of Francis's future during his early teens, 
In 1998, Francis was suspended from school for choking another student. In 1999, Francis shot a rifle into a truckload of teens and injured his best friend. He was sentenced to 180 days in a juvenile detention center, but was released after a month. In 2005, Francis was arrested again. This time, he was charged with breaking into a home, holding the residents hostage, and then robbing them. However, he was acquitted of the charges at trial, and for nine years, things were quiet for Francis Weaver, until February 19, 2014, when Francis was arrested, along with three other men, for the murder of Edward Spangler. Spangler had been found shot to death in his car. Prosecutors said that Francis conspired with Michael Oren, Shannon Bedencourt, to rob Spangler, a local drug dealer. Fifteen pounds of marijuana was found in Spangler's car by police. According to court documents, police found text messages between Francis and Michael, where they were tracking Spangler's whereabouts. The two confronted Spangler and Oren shot and killed him. Spangler jumped in his car in an effort to flee, but succumbed to his injuries and crashed his car. Police responded to calls about the car crash and found Spangler dead inside. It was when they noticed the gunshot wounds that they realized that this was not an ordinary car accident. Although he was not the shooter, Francis was charged with murder because he supplied Michael with the gun that took Spangler's life. In March 2016, Francis was sentenced to life in prison. Unlike his father, Francis showed deep remorse for his crimes. He cried as he addressed the family of Spangler, saying, quote, I know he was a good man, a very good man and a good son. That was never supposed to happen. I pray for you guys every day. I pray for his children every day. Maria Shaw, Francis's mother and Ward's first wife, was very vocal about her belief of her son's innocence. Maria was interviewed right after Francis's arrest and claimed that she knew for a fact that Francis was home during the time of the murder. She also claimed that Francis was taking the blame for the murder simply because of who his father was. Her feelings didn't change after her son was found guilty. When the verdict was read, she shouted in the courtroom, There is no justice. Justice is not served. It's not right. They framed my son in everything. They framed him. Maria found herself in trouble with the law around the same time of her son's arrest. In April 2014, Canby, Oregon police conducted a search warrant on the home of Maria Shaw. The search warrant was based on allegation of Shaw selling meth out of her home, along with her son Francis. When the warrant was served, police said they found drug paraphernalia and drug records in the home. Maria was not home at the time of the search, and a warrant for her arrest was issued. There is no record of her being convicted of any crime following the search. In 2010, Mallory Weaver, Ward's daughter and friend of Ashley and Miranda, was charged with attempted assault, disorderly conduct, criminal trespassing, and harassment that arose from an alleged attack on a hospital security guard. On July 21, 2010, Portland police were called to the Providence Medical Center in response to a report of a patient's family attacking hospital security. Upon arrival, Hospital staff told police that Maria Shaw, Mallory's mother, had been admitted the day before for mental health issues. When Mallory and her stepfather came to visit, they attempted to remove Maria from the hospital by force. When security guards tried to escort the two to the ambulance bay, a struggle broke out. A nurse and two security guards suffered minor injuries. One of the guards alleged that Mallory punched him in the face. In December 2010, Mallory was acquitted of all charges. Ward pled guilty to the murders of Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis on September 22, 2004. He was given two life sentences to be served at the Snake River Correctional Institution in the Administrative Segregation Unit. Even behind bars, Ward accrued his enemies. In April of 2007, Ward was stabbed in the neck while getting his hair cut by Marvin Lee Taylor. He survived the attack, and the motivation behind the attack is unclear, but Marvin was ultimately found guilty of assault. 
The Weavers were a doomed family from the beginning. The cycle of abuse, violence, drug use, and alcoholism seemed to contribute to its demise. The ending, for the Weavers, was always going to be an unhappy one. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Special thanks to Marissa Jones, host of the Vanished Podcast, for recommending this topic. We would like to thank Pitney Bowes for sponsoring this episode. Visit pb.com slash tcfc to learn more and try sending solutions for free. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really helps us out. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com forward slash TCFC podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, TCFC underscore podcast. And of course, our website is truecrimefanclub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. Music for the show was provided by We Talk of Dreams, who created custom music just for us. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or We Talk of Dreams.com. Research assistance, content editing, and writing assistance for the show was provided by Brittany Martinez. Audio engineering was provided by Ches Gray, who manages Ches Gray Music. Content warning at the top of the show was provided by Tyler Allen, host of the Minds of Madness podcast.